I'm Alex and Molly's here with us and Eric's here and Tolga's here um, and Terry's here and Carrie has joined us all the way from Canada and uh, uh, Australia I guess is for Terry so all over the world there's we've had some weather phenomena going on we were discussing it mostly with Eric and Molly and me talking about the fires out west here I hope you're all safe from that and from the COVID diseases um, you know, and everything's going well for you. We've all kind of gotten accustomed to it a little bit. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about what's coming up in the Astro Imaging Channel. And to do that, of course, I have to go to the calendar. And as you can see with the Astro Imaging Channel, um, Carrie Ann's here today. Brent's going to be talking about Astro Pixel Processor next week. And Andrew Campbell is going to be... You're not sharing uh, your screen. Oh, sorry about that. Um, hang on for a second, folks. I'll get back to sharing my screen here. Present now your entire screen. I thought I was doing really well there for a while. You are. Thank, thanks for bringing reality back to me. Okay. You're doing great, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm back to my screen. Carrie's here, Brent. Uh, Andy Astro is going to be here on October 4th. And then look at, we've got an open day on October 11th. We need somebody to volunteer, one of you guys out there, to come on in and tell us about what there, what there is to see uh, up in the sky, what there is to image. Um, Linda last week, uh, Linda Fowler Thomas from um, uh, one of our one of our own. She's been uh, watching the Astro Imaging Channel every Sunday and contributing to the conversation over there. Uh, she gave a wonderful presentation last week, and you know, I think all of you, most of you anyway, can give such a presentation. Um, uh, and in order to do so, you come back to the contacts area and just give us your name and your email and say what it is that you'd like to tell us about. And we'll talk to you a little bit about it by email and we'll get you arranged so that you can come on in. Um, remember, some of our most popular shows have been by people who um, were not way advanced in it. Some of our popular shows, you know, how I got started or mistakes I made um, or inexpensive astroimaging tricks I have found. These things are, are very important to us. We've got lots of shows. We've coming up on what, seven years now or something like that. So, uh, it, you know, seven times 45, 50 uh, uh, shows every um, year. Well, we're starting to get up, uh, I think it's more like about 320 some shows. So, um, Please join us and, and go through our catalogs at various points. Week after that, Barbara Harris will be here and she's gonna be telling us about uh, observing variable stars with very, very minor equipment, a DSLR. And Amy Astro is gonna be joining us the week after that. So please be part of this lineup. We have to find somebody for October 11th and that date is getting closer. We like staying six weeks ahead. And right now we've only got the six weeks and one of those is empty. So. Please, everything I can do to get you to volunteer, we need you to volunteer. Now you'll notice over here on the YouTube chat, there's a place for all of you to make comments and ask questions for Carrie. If you've got anything that you'd like to know for, for Carrie, please get it in over here. But there's also some other things uh, over here. Um, there's a place to subscribe. What are we up to um, now? We're probably about nine and a half thousand. Okay, and we wanna get up to 10,000. Uh, because I don't know, it just seems like it'd be cool to be at 10,000. There are a lot of advantages actually uh, in managing the YouTube. You get you get ways to analyze your data. You get ways to um, uh, store more stuff and things like that. So it would really help us if we could get everybody who's watching this uh, to subscribe to the Astro Imaging channel. And of course, we know Carrie's gonna do a good job. She's been here two, three times before and she always does a good job. So be sure that you click the, the like pages and things like that. There's also some place around here, a place to contribute if you'd like to show support. Uh, we've decided we need a little bit of equipment, some microphone and some headsets and some other things like that um, in order to make things a little more clear for people. So we are going to have to spend some money on that. And we do have uh, regular expenses of paying for Google's uh, subscription and some other things. So we'd appreciate that. Anyway, that's the business. And it looks like our crowd is building up. So we're getting ready to go. So um, Carrie Ann has been with us before. 
and she does a wonderful presentation. She does a great job of um, doing astro landscapes. I've seen her presentations at both NEAC and at uh, the Advanced Imaging Conference in San Jose, California. So as she's speaking, telling us about how she plans her astro imaging sessions, please go ahead and contribute your, comp your questions and comments over here on the right-hand side. With all that in mind, I am going to stop presenting and, um, oh, hi, Tolga, you're on my screen. Um, okay. And go on back to, and hand it over to um, Carrie. Carrie, you ready to take it? Yep, Start can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, you're fine. Okay, I'll do the present now thing. Hopefully nothing goes wrong. Okay. I'm a Mac newbie here. <laughs> so this is my first time doing a presentation with this um, with this keynote um, keynote PowerPoint presentation sort of thing. Anyway, so basically my topic is going to be about um, astro astronomy landscape image planning. And uh, the purpose of it is basically I want to, people to see beyond um, taking astro landscape, uh, nightscape images beyond the sweeping Milky Way views that we typically see all the time. And, um, you know, like with astronomy, as, as astronomers and astrophotographers, we know that there's so many objects in the night sky to view. And to um, and a lot of the deep sky objects in the night sky, um, it's hard for people to gain like real appreciation for it if they don't see any sort of um, ground based um, you know, features associated with it or beside it. So, um, yeah, so basically I want to build some appreciation and more awareness of the objects in the night sky through photography and also to encourage deep sky astrophotographers into nightscape photography. Um, it can be a different kind of challenge for sure. Like we all know deep sky astrophotography is like really challenging and uh, nightscape has its own challenges. So why not put them all together? I mean, we all do this hobby and, um, we know how much work it is. We might as well add more work to it, right? <laughs> anyway, so um, what I'm going to be doing is I'll just show you some examples of some real kind of like fake examples and then some real examples uh, with some planning details. And then um, I'll try to take you through a live demo uh, using software of how I, I go about planning these um, these types of images. And also we'll talk a little bit about clouds and atmospheric transparency as well, because that's super important. Is everyone seeing this okay? Yep, perfect. All right, good, yeah, awesome. Good. Yeah, so um, basically this, these pictures, some of these pictures you're gonna, like I've never shared any of these pictures before. So um, I typically, like most of my shots that I will post and share um, are, generally what I call quote unquote real astro images. Um, but I went through a period of time where, um, you know, when I post my, posted my deep sky astro images, um, people wouldn't really gain as much appreciation for it because they just couldn't understand, they could, they see it as more of an abstract as opposed to um, something real, something that they can connect with. And so um, I started playing around with these surreal sort of images where I would mix uh, my deep sky images with my daytime landscape images. So here's one of NGC 7822. I actually haven't even published that um, deep sky image. I'm still working on it. <laughs> it's been years in progress. And um, this one I published, um, I see 5076, and I just thought, oh, it looked cool with, um, you know, uh, a wintry scene. So I kind of worked it into a winter scene there. And I just thought, you know, maybe people would appreciate a little bit more. But, um, and then here's M31, <laughs> so a little crazy looking. Um, but the thing is, is that um, a lot of people, like they, they, they love seeing these kind of images, but then they are always asking, is it real or fake? And then sometimes if you post online and say that it's, um, it's, it's, not, it's a composite image or it's artistic, a lot of people don't actually read that. And then they, they you know, everything can go viral and people will lose the whole, um, you know, story behind the actual image and, and they will lose the fact that it, that you already shared that it wasn't a real image. But anyway, so um, 
fast forward to now, like basically I do a lot of nightscape imaging and, you know, over the years of just doing this and seeing the Milky Way in so many different ways, you know, you get kind of, um, you start to get a little bit, um, not bored, but you kind of want something a little bit more. And especially if you're a deep sky astrophotographer and, or even an astronomer, you, you know that there's so much more in the night sky than just the Milky Way Galactic Center. So um, here are just a few images that I took um, during my nightscape adventures that don't, that don't have the galactic center involved. And, you know, I think that they turned out quite well, like um, Easter Island with the Moy, and um, you can see uh, Orion peeking through. And then we have the Eta Carina Nebula there with the palm trees. And, you know, typically you might not see these kind of pictures because they're just expecting to see like the the big the big beautiful milky way stretching across the sky now carrie are, are these composites um no these are these, these are, are the real actual, these are yeah. totally real actually a lot of my shots end up being single exposures because <laughs> at a certain point in the night i just get so tired <laughs> and i just want to take oh. a single shot so and i do like quite a bit of editing of course to try to bring out as much color and details um, I, I think the last time you were here, you told us about the Mori pictures, how you composed that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yeah, clouds, one, those clouds were moving all over the place, and that's that wasn't one big cloud cover. Oh, yeah, sorry. Lots this, of is, this is a composite in a different kind of way, in that I basically um, composed, um, joined up the images that had clear spots um, that didn't have a cloud covering over it, just to get a bigger patch of sky that was clear. Right. But yeah. it's still like, you know, basically like the scene kind of was in that in that form. So it wasn't like a composite of um of the nice guy with the moon. I, I know your pictures are magical, but I I couldn't imagine you mad getting a set of clouds to stay still long enough to grab <laughs> that deep space picture. So. No. In this case, I was just a little patient and I just waited and took a bunch of pictures, just snapped away constantly hoping for clear patches here and there, and then eventually putting the clear patches together to create like a bigger view of the night sky. So, um, and then here with the, the volcano in Villarica volcano in Chile, um, they see the Carina rising behind the volcano. And then um, in Death Valley, this other picture to the right here with um, Cassiopeia, you know, not a lot of people will think about Cassiopeia as being like a, a center feature of an image, but, you know, like with the, a longer lens and with some, some trees or maybe a shrub in the foreground, you can um, get a shot with, um, you know, of something a little bit different other than the Milky Way Galactic Center. And in this case, I got lucky and caught a meteor in there as well. And then, so basically, I just want to share some images from some friends um, on the internet that also um, have been like taking some deep deep sky images with landscapes. And these are all real shots. Uh, they're not composites um, in the sense where you have one object from one location and then um, composing it with a totally different um, like scenery. So this is all like uh, one location where you have the night sky and the scenery as well. And this particular image by Nicholas Tabouche, uh, I hope I, I'm saying his name right. Um, but anyways, I put his Instagram link in there too. Um, so this is a pretty amazing photo of uh, showing some of the, you know, popular features of Orion. Like in the constellation Orion, you have the Orion Nebula, the Horsehead Nebula, and uh, a lot of the dust involved as well. And uh, for this shot, like he basically used a 180 millimeter lens and he was in this, um, he didn't really use a lot of planning software in this case to, to find this image. He was in this location for a few days. So he had a feel for the landscape and the, and the astro um, situation at the time. And he knew that, you know, uh, between three and five Orion Nebula, I mean, Orion would be in the right position to be able to take this picture over the Argentine mountains. And um, it's basically 26, um, 26 shots, three minutes shots stacked together. And um, he told me that he, um, he waited for a blue hour to get a little bit more detail on the, um, the landscape itself. So and this actually ended up getting an astronomy picture of the day. 
And here's a, some of his um, imaging details as well. Like he, he shared with me the location that he was at and um, the mountain range, I believe it was this mountain range here that he was shooting from, shooting towards where Orion was. And um, he's using a 180 millimeter lens. And uh, the software that produced this particular view is called Planet Pro. And um, there's a whole there's a whole slew of uh, planning, astro planning um, um, software out there. And uh, this and they all have their plus and minuses and some like Planet Pro I found like has some pretty cool features. So in this case, you can see like it kind of gave this augmented view of Orion the um the belt and um it actually had some he had to download some topography there's an option to download the topography of where you are and you can basically um line up your shot and see where everything is to make sure everything works out just fine so that's just a, an example of that and then the next shot here by yuri beletsky his instagram is also here as well if you want to check out some of his amazing images uh, this amazing view here is of the one meter swope telescope in Chile. And um, for this shot, um, he wasn't as far away from the from the target. Uh, he was about, I believe it's uh, 35 meters away from the from the dome. And also the dome was a little bit higher up and he was able to frame the large Magellanic clouds and the, the small Magellanic cloud. Um, on either side of the dome. So that's a pretty cool view as well. And I believe this is a single exposure. And then this uh, other amazing shot by Alan Wallace. Um, he's got a YouTube channel. He's pretty popular astro uh, photographer, astro landscape photographer on YouTube. So you should check out this video on this particular image that he took. And it's in. it was shot in the Canary Islands. Um, and I believe, yeah, he, he did this with a fellow named Adrian Modwit. And they used a Samyang 135 millimeter lens at F2, so nice uh, fast lens. And uh, this particular shot was stacked and also tracked. And um, he goes through the whole planning of it. And they also, they had to use like radio, uh, radios to, to communicate with each other so that he could um, get a shot. This is actually Alan here on the mountains here, and he wanted to have it so that the row off Ucus was like shooting out of his chest. So they had to like do a lot of planning to try to get, um, you know, to get uh, everything just lined up just perfectly. So yeah, definitely check out that video. It's pretty cool. And um, also, so now I just want to go through some details of um, of how um, how we plan, like how I would probably go about planning um, astro landscape photo, just some points and some tips to uh, consider while you do it. This picture here is kind of just a funny, funny one from a friend of mine, uh, John Myrtle. He was saying that uh, he shot this picture of M6 in, from Alberta and M6 is super, super low to the ground. So he's like, oh, it's so low that you can see a gopher there. So he just composted the gopher on on there, just thought it was cute. So, but it does, it kind of brings some, a little bit of realism to, even though it's not really a real picture. Uh, so anyway, so when it comes to planning, um, the way how you approach your planning will vary depending on your goals. Like you might want to plan for a particular image. Like let's say you want, you want a landscape shot to incorporate to have M42 in the field. You're gonna be planning that shot differently than um, because you have to find a location, um, an appropriate location where you can see M42 um, behind, behind it, behind the foreground. Um, the other type of planning would be like, if you find like a really um, good foreground element and then you have to be able to find a target after that point and then that can also pose another set of challenges because um, you might not have as much um, you might not be able to move around that particular foreground element to get a good view of, um, of of like different types of targets you might only have like one direction that you can face and then in that case you have to find a particular astro image 
to go that will f go behind that target on a particular time of the year or whatever. And um, so another thing too, so basically finding a point of interest. So this can be architectural or a geological feature. In this case here, I was at um, Tea Kettle Junction and of course you see the tea kettle in the sky kind of lined up with it. I didn't use any planning software for this. I just happened to get really lucky with um, seeing the two things and uh, the, the Sagittarius in the sky and then the teapots on the stand. So that was cool. Um, and another thing too is, um, of course, when you're picking a target, you have to keep in mind the part of the world that you are in. So um, if you know you're going to be going down to Chile, then you have to, you know, set your planetarium software up to for Chile so that you can see um, just the objects in the night sky for that time of year and for that location. And um, when it comes to picking a spot to shoot from, it can get a little bit tricky because sometimes you're limited with where you can go. Um, first of all, you definitely want to think of the rising and the setting time um, azimuth of the target object. So, um, for instance, like, you know, you want to find out where, um, like, if it's M42 that you're taking a picture of, you want to know at what azimuth does it rise and set because. Typically, if you're going to be taking a landscape shot in conjunction with that object, you need um, you need that that object to be low enough in the sky so that you get a good enough uh, framing of it, so you can frame it properly. So, um, but then also, I mean, depending on how high your um, the tar the foreground feature is as well, you have to take that into consideration. But I always like to start with finding out the azimuth where it rises and the azimuth where it sets for that particular location, and then kind of work from there. Um, the other thing too is you definitely want a clear and unobstructed view. Um, altitude matters, so um, you could be, you know, if it's if the scene is fairly low to the ground and you have a lot of um, mist in the atmosphere or haze, um, the transparency overall will be so much lower and then you won't see that object very well in the night sky. So, I mean, even just looking at this picture here, you can see um, behind this Kalbuka um, volcano, I'm pretty far from it here, uh, but low down you see, you can't really see the um, objects in the night sky um, that low the higher up, if I was closer to this volcano, then um, I would be able to see objects, take an image of objects higher up, and then the view would be a lot more clearer. Um, and also distant clouds definitely poses a bigger problem too when it comes to astral landscape imaging, um, because you know, you can have a perfectly clear floor forecast for your location, but if there's a weather system 50 kilometers away, uh, you're going to see that it won't, the forecast won't call for clouds for you. It will call for clear skies, but then you will see those clouds from far away. And that, that could potentially ruin your, your, um, your plan for that night. Um, and also you want to consider the direction of the light pollution. So, you know, you want to have a light pollution map handy and uh, whatever target you're shooting and, um, and foreground feature, you, you should probably line it up where there's no light pollution in behind it. So that can also ruin things as well. Um, you also want to think about the framing. So for instance, um, the further away you are, uh, the longer the focal length and the bigger the astro image in the frame. So basically your astro image isn't going to change its size because we're in a fixed position on Earth re relative to um, to these astro images, like in terms of distance and how large these astro images will look on the frame. So if you're shooting like the moon, let's say, or the sun, um, and you use a 400 millimeter lens, it's always going to look the same size pretty much look the same size in that lens. But for your foreground element, like your, your the feature that you're trying to put in the foreground, um, you want to make sure that that is, um, you know, that you're far enough away from it. So the, the ratio, the size of the object you're shooting in the foreground compared to the size of the astro image is, um, you know, reasonable or to your liking. So 
here I have like a couple little formulas to kind of do some comparison. So, I mean, you might just want to take note of that and just throw some, throw it in um, these numbers in a calculator if you are picking an object that you want to shoot and um, like an astro object that you want to shoot. And let's say you have an object uh, for like a foreground element that you want to take a picture of, take note of the size of that element, and then you can plug in the calculator how far you need to be away from that um, that foreground element to see it at a reasonable amount of size in comparison to that astro image or that um, that astro target. So um, in this case here, I have the sun rising behind the CN Tower and I'm, I'm um, several miles or several, several kilometers away from the CN Tower in order to be able to um, use a 400 millimeter lens to then shoot it with the sun rising. So the sun will also will look big in the 400 millimeter lens and um, and then zooming in at 400 millimeters, you know, the CN Tower will also look somewhat big as well. So those are just some complications and some things that you should keep in mind when you're choosing your, your target, your um, astro target and your foreground feature. I hope I didn't lose anyone. <laughs> Anyway, so another thing that you definitely have to do is, You're doing uh, good. huh? You're doing good. You're here. Okay, good. Awesome. <laughs> I'm also taking a peek at the comments here. Has Karian written book? No, I haven't written a book. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Well, thanks for the support. Um, yeah, nice comments. Uh, so, anyways, so with um, when you go on. One of the big things when you're doing an astro planning session is you must, if you at all, you have to go on location or you should go on location to scout around because uh, you never know what kind of um, things will crop up. For instance, uh, obstructions like what you might you might do your planning on Google Earth or these uh, planning software, but then um, you might realize that um, you know. Like you might think that that what you see on Google is what you will actually see when you get there, but that's not the case. So um, yeah, ob obstructions could be in the way, like there could be even new obstructions in the way of your, your field of view. And also artificial lights is a huge one. Even like when you're planning, um, when you're scouting a location during the day, I always try to look around to see if I see any light bulbs or light stands or anything that might uh, interfere with the with the image at nighttime. It's very hard to see these things. Um, you know, obviously if you're not if you're there during the day, it's harder to, to notice those things. Um, if you can go at night, I mean that would be even better too. Um, you know, some places they actually have um, lights that that start up during the day, and <clears throat> and they're um, they're triggered by uh, by motion, uh, lights that are uh, motion detecting lights, and also you might have access restrictions. So there could be like a a barrier for a road, and then you might not be able to even get to your location. So um, here's just an example of um, of a uh, photo pills used on location during the day. Photo pills has this really cool feature for, um, for augmented reality. So I can basically hold my phone up um, and it's, it uses the phone's camera and uh, photo pills has overlaid on top um, the Milky Way or different or the sun and the moon and uh, different features. So I can then sort of plan my session to see wh what things will look like uh, approximately what it will look like uh, when I actually go out to actually to take the picture at night. So here's the actual image that I was able to take at night from planning this from this view here. So it's pretty similar. So that was def definitely helpful just to give you some a uh, little bit of realism uh, before you go out. And uh, in terms of equipment, I wasn't really going to touch on like how you actually take the picture or equipment, but I just think this part is is somewhat important. Um, one thing is uh, when you're doing these astro landscape shots, if you want to get a deep image, you need to have um, a camera that's really low noise um, and a fast lens as fast as possible is is better because um, you're not going to be able to, like with deep sky astrophotography, you're taking 
an image that's, you know, integration time of hours, but you can't really do that in the field when you're doing these astro landscape shots. You want something that's going to give you the biggest amount of impact with with the, um, the tools that you have. So low, no low noise camera, fast lens, um, appropriate zoom for the target that you want to shoot, target and foreground element. And of course, you want a very steady tripod because especially if you're um, shooting at these longer focal lengths, you need um, you need a good um, a good uh, tripod that won't be shaking in the wind or anything like that. And a tracker, of course, will be helpful, especially helpful because the longer the focal length, of course, means um, the the shorter your exposure times will have to be in order to make sure that the stars are not um, are not um, going to move in the frame and a remote timer, of course, and the apps for planning. And then uh, lastly, one of the very important things actually you should do this right before you leave is always check the weather, check the current clouds, um, find out if there's any weather systems nearby. So don't just check your local forecast, check the forecast of the neighboring regions around you to see if there's anything going on because those clouds in those distant places could affect your, your imaging as well. Um, actually, funny thing is that you can have, um, and you can be shooting towards the southern sky and have somewhat a, like a cloud system, a, a weather system close to you, almost on top of you, but you can still shoot um, like if it's in the north, but then if you're shooting in the south, you can, um, you can still actually take um, images, take pictures of the night sky if it's low down in the horizon to the south. So, I mean, all these little things that you would have to consider uh, so definitely check all, all those aspects of weather. And also transparency. Um, smoke is a huge problem. Uh, we've noticed that across all of North America, actually, like a few days ago, it was smoky everywhere, even out here towards and towards the East Coast. Um, the smoke can is not really predicted in the weather forecasts. Um, so that's just something you should be checking the satellite imagery to see where it is. And typically like when a cold front goes through or a new air mass goes through, then it, it, it clears out in the air for um, those areas, unless you're of course in the area, in the region where the smoke is coming from. Um, the other thing too is this haze and mist. Um, this year we haven't had as much smog, I noticed, um, but typically in the summer, you can get a lot of that smog and smoggy air ruin your your um, shots as well and this this is all because when you're doing the landscape and astro landscape shots you're shooting um, your angle that you're shooting at is low in the sky and so it's very particular with um, these uh, weather conditions so basically I'm going to take you through just a little um, I guess kind of like a uh, my planning session for uh, this comet NeoY so uh, it was always, it was pretty exciting when I found out that Neowise was going to be um, be like a, a major feature in the night sky. So my goal was basically to try to capture it and along with uh, a foreground element that's pretty popular, such as the, the Toronto skyline or the CN Tower. So with that, I started planning. It took me like a whole day of planning. I didn't have much time because I found out about it on the, the 4th of July. And then it was um, by the July 5th, I, I knew I had to like be out there on the road and taking pictures because, you know, um, I wanted to be, I wanted to get some shots out on the internet as quickly as possible. So uh, basically with this, um, I had to I checked the light pollution. Of course, it's going to be pretty bad where I'm located, but because Comet Neowise was in the night sky, or sorry, in more in the in the morning sky, so I knew that if it was visible with the morning sky or with the sun um, just below the horizon, then light pollution shouldn't be a major factor. Um, so basically, I knew from Sky Safari app that at its at the part where at this altitude above the horizon where I thought would be reasonable to start shooting it, um, it ended up being around 44 degrees in azimuth. 
So in Sky Safari, you can check that azimuth and the altitude. So I have altitude of 2.4 degrees. And um, I planned on shooting this with my zoom lens, 400 millimeters. And with that, then I realized, okay, with 400 millimeters and it's two degrees above the horizon, it might be a little bit risky because I didn't know how long the tail would be. So I kind of figured, okay, maybe I should go a little bit wider with my, um, with my lens. So in this case, I, I, I planned um, using a 100 millimeter lens to get a bigger view and just so to, um, you know, in case there's some unknowns with how large and how bright this comet ends up being. So I decided to take the shot from, um, I lined it up in, um, in uh, photo pills and I found that there's a bridge nearby um, on off of Lake Ontario, the Burlington Skyway Bridge. And from there, I did some Google Earth uh, trips and I checked out the area on Google Earth. And I figured that, okay, from that location, if I point it at Toronto, the azimuth um, could potentially be around 44 degrees and the comet should rise above the city uh, in that location. And then basically, here's my Google Earth trip that I took. And so the street views is so handy for these kind of things um, because it gets gives you an idea of, of um, what you're up against when you actually, before you get on location. So uh, this spot was probably the best location that I could find where I have a view of the Toronto skyline from a distance in that proper angle where I'm facing 44 degrees of azimuth where the comet should be. So here's this quick little video here of me. I actually ended up going on location that same day because I was worried that with uh, COVID that they would have uh, blocked off this area and uh, luckily they didn't. So I was, um, I was happy, but I originally I didn't plan on actually going there. So all of this happened in like less than a day of planning. And then here's just a quick little video of me zooming in to see the Toronto skyline. It's my little shaky cell phone view. And then here, uh, basically we planned on getting up around three o'clock. I rounded up a bunch of my friends astronomy and photography friends and I said let's go out and take a picture of this comet and um, we met and everyone was a little bit late we were all kind of late so I absolutely missed um, the comet at its prime location where it's supposed to be so I had to improvise while it was there so um, in the end this was a shot that I ended up getting so you can see like the comet was a little bit off here. I was you, in photo pills. I wasn't perfectly lined up with the CN Tower. I wanted to be lined up with the CN Tower at the time. So, I mean, that was just my fault and the fact that I was planning so quickly and um, for this type of event. So basically this was a several one second exposure stacked and 100, at 160 millimeters, I had to go um, wider just because um, you know, it was getting a little bit higher in the sky and also the the sun was starting to get a little bit high up there. So um, yeah, oh yeah, this picture ended up going viral. <laughs> it was probably my most viral image um, that I put out there. And I think it's, it's all about the timing because not there weren't that many pictures of the comet at this time by like in July, by July 5th. So um, it, it took a lot of, um, it was a lot of effort, though, getting all the pictures assembled and like being up at four in the morning and not sleeping and then staying up all day, like during the day to try to edit this and post it online. But it was worth it in the end. And so um, knowing that, like I decided, OK, I have some time with this comet and it's still going to be around. It's going to be brighter. So I decided um I'm going to take a picture, try to take a, another picture of it, but this time I'm really going to line it up with the CN Tower. And I use photo pills for that as well. And um, you can see here, I found the date of um, July 18th would be um, where the comet would be right over the CN Tower. 
so in this case, I basically had my location chosen and I just had to get find the right date for the comet. So um, yeah, so I basically scanned through my Sky Safari app until I could get the azimuth to line up with 14.9 degrees or around 15 degrees, which is the direction, the azimuth direction of where uh, the tower was from my home location. So this is my home here. I've got like, um, I was up on a balcony and um, you can see Lake Ontario and the Toronto skylines right across here. So um, the thing too, I, I thought I would have a, a good advantage this way because, uh, because I'm a little bit higher up. So when you're down on the ground, um, on the sea level, I guess the the, the lake level, you get more distortions towards the horizon and the city might not look as crisp and clear. But I thought, you know, with the little altitude that I have on the escarpment, um, it would help me in this for this shot. So let me see if there's anything I missed. Uh, so yeah, I planned on using my 400. Oh, wait, I have this is my 400 millimeter field of view. I basically Pro put all my um, field of views, all my types of lenses into Sky Safari so that I can see what they will look like um, combined with um, the certain astro targets. And it helps me out a lot. Um, this is my 100 millimeter field of view. So um, now basically I just waited for the state to come and I prayed that the clouds would not be a problem. And um, so this was at 3.51 in the morning. That's when I had to wake up. I actually lost so much sleep this for two weeks because of this comment I had. I was exhausted. And so here was a shot. So this is a single exposure from my um, from my balcony. There's a comet Neowise and I had to use a 190 millimeter lens in this case and this was a four second exposure. So I did a little bit, yeah, I had it on tracking, but it was like super rough tracking. It wasn't even, you know, I didn't have it like heavily polar aligned. I didn't think it was necessary for this type of focal length. Um, so yeah, so F5.6, 190 millimeters, four seconds. And then I took several of these shots while it was just over like a little, several before and several after um, it passed the CN Tower. And then I was able to get this shot here. So this is like a combined of all those shots. I combined them in a software called Sequator. And then I did some editing in Photoshop. So um, yeah, so that one, I haven't sh shared that picture with anyone yet. So I'll probably go on my Instagram in a couple of days. <laughs> so now basically the hard part, I'm going to do a live demo of uh, Sky Safari. And um, and photo pills and Planet Pro, and just to see if we can um, come up with the plan for a particular object in the night sky, and just so you can see how I, or I run through it. So I'm just hoping that everything works out fine because, you know, when you do live things, it doesn't always work out. Uh, but anyways, are there any questions so far before I get into this? Uh, there have been a couple people, Carrie, that wondered whether you well someone asked about a book you saw that question uh but any videos or you want to put up your site so people might be able to you know learn a little bit about how you do what you do oh okay so um i know i should have put i think i have my instagram address at the beginning of this my first slide but um if you just search for weather and sky dot com that's my website address and all my social media links are at weather and sky. So Instagram, Twitter, and all of that. So, um, and usually on my Instagram, I, I think most my astro images are mostly are mainly up to date on Instagram, not necessarily on my website. Um, and in Instagram, whenever I post a photo, I always list the details of uh, the shots. So I will mention if it's a single exposure, what camera I used, what lens I used, and um, all of that. So um, you'll probably learn a bit just from reading about the shot. Like I, I usually write a story along with um, every shot that I post as well. So. so when you have a new target about how much planning goes into it, I'm sure it varies by target, like getting up in the middle of the morning and running out and taking a yeah. picture of the comet. But generally speaking, if you have to travel, how much goes into 
Oh, um, a lot. Oh my goodness. Sometimes it can take me days to try to figure out, um, you know, just the framing of an object and going over like sky safari and then photo pills and plant uh, photo pills mainly um, just to make sure everything lines up. Um, there are some times though, when, you know, whenever I've been traveling, um, you know, to Chile or, you know, Australia, sometimes you just, there is no, not much planning. I just kind of go on location to this epic location. And then, you know, you, you work with the sky that you have available to you and then you find, um, cool compositions just in the moment. So, I mean, that's always a way to do it. So, um, you don't have to necessarily be completely stressed out by doing this detailed planning. You can, you can just wing it for the most part, but if you want something very specific, then it can take, it can take a while to plan that sort of thing. So do you ever put on any workshops? Yeah. So, um, I've been working with Yuri Beletsky to get some workshops going and we hope to do some in Chile. Uh, hopefully when travel starts to open up again, but um, if you follow me on Instagram or follow, follow Yuri Beletsky as well, um, we'll be posting, um, we'll be posting like when a workshop comes up and um, you know, you can just, you can drop me a line as well. Like if you send me your name with your email, then, um, you know, I will definitely add you to a list and anytime there's a workshop coming, I will send you an email. So you know about it before we actually even post about it. I think that's all we have for now. Uh, Alex? Yeah. Sorry. Anybody there's else? A, there's another question from John at Astra um asking about what is, what is the basic investment like for doing landscape astrophotography um for putting on gear uh it, well i think like if you're already an astrophotographer and you do deep sky i think you'll find the investment to be fairly reasonable like i mean you probably have most of the gear that you already have already you already have everything that you need um but if you're just coming from like you know where you haven't been doing photography or or any um, nightscape imaging at all, then you you would want to invest in um, a good DSLR or mirrorless camera that's uh, very low noise. So that could be you know a couple thousand dollars for just that camera body itself, and then a good fast lens and lenses. You can get some lenses for under thousand dollars easily um, that will do the trick for you, and that will be really good. Uh, for the task, uh, tripods, a few hundred dollars, tracking mounts. I mean, they can range in range in um, cost, but you definitely find a lot of um, reasonable ones for um, that perform well for in the few hundred dollar range, like even like five hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars, that kind of thing. So um, for photographers now, like if they're if they want to be um, invest in something to do like daytime photographers, if they want to invest in, in doing um, astro landscapes, then I'd suggest just getting a really good tracking mount and make sure that you're, um, you have a good stable tripod for that tracking mount. Um, so, I mean, cause most, most daytime photographers probably already have uh, a long telephoto lens as well that can go with it. So, and, you know, I always suggest anyways, if you're totally brand new to nightscape imaging to just play around with taking the wide field, big Milky Way, sweeping Milky Way shots that you see a lot of, just play around with that and then gradually increase your focal length um, as you're doing it like over time and get more comfort level with, um, you know, going deeper in your shots and also longer focal length and then as you go longer in your focal length that's when you start to really need that tracking mount um so anyways but you know it doesn't have to be a huge investment depending on where you are currently in your photography journey uh, but you're suggesting strictly dslr as your camera DSLR rather than say or, or a cmos yeah dslr or mirrorless cameras are usually good for this kind of thing um you know, Astro CCD cameras, I don't, I've never done that. I think it would probably be a little bit more cumbersome to use those kind of cameras. So, but yeah. 
And definitely one shot color. Yes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because if you want to make your life um, miserable, then use a mono CCD camera. <laughs> so yeah, I wouldn't recommend that. But DSLR or mirrorless, those kind of cameras for sure. Is the difference between um, and performance for noise and everything else between the mirrorless and the DSLR pretty close now? Um, I don't really know, you know. Um, I mean, I use a Canon 6D, my DSLR for a lot of my, um, for most of my landscape shots, night sky, nightscape shots, um, and I still love it. Uh, but I know that the the mirrorless cameras, they've come so far and surpassed a lot of the DSLR sensors. So, I mean, like the Sony mirrorless cameras are amazing and there's the, can, the new Canon um, RA that's a pair that's supposed to be really amazing as well. So, I mean, you just have to do some research to see what's the latest out there that you can um, that you can afford. But I mean, I still hang on to my Canon 6D for now. So, and I love it. And I think it does the the job well. And it's old. It's basically a 10 year old camera that um, that probably costs under a thousand dollars now. So, the camera body itself used actually probably even less than that if it's used but the equipment doesn't make the photograph the photographer does yeah i think so <laughs> no i think that's that's true in, in uh dso's planetary everything yeah yeah not the equipment yeah. exactly well, like, I, I, mean, I i agree with you that the real difference between the the good ones is the the imager rather than the camera but having a good camera really gets you over a lot of humps uh the, the, yeah. you know, too much noise is just not good you got to deal with the noise uh it'll still make a nice picture but it won't make a great one yet yeah that's the thing like um you're probably you might end up limiting your frustration if you um start with like the best year out there but it's not going to necessarily give you the best photo it will just give you a good helping hand to begin with if you've been doing it for a long time you're comfortable with photo editing then i'd say like work with what you have and you know build from that point on if you feel you need something more then go for something more but um for these particular shots when you're going uh longer in in focal length and um and uh you know, you're trying to get these astral landscape shots, I really suggest like getting a, you know, you might want to get a lens that's really sharp and r fairly fast uh, because you don't have that much time to waste when you're taking that that shot, you know, and you need a, a reasonable tracker as well, so. But don't wait that's until you've got everything set up just right to go out and, and try. Yeah, yeah. So that's just a form of procrastination that we all know about. So yeah, it can be a little tricky. Uh, you have to find a good balance and you definitely have to try to make use of your clear nights, dark nights and get out there with your camera and practice and practice photo editing too, because photo editing is such a huge part of it. Like, you know, if, if people saw the raw images that I took and, um, and compare it to the actual final image, you, you it's totally different. I mean, not totally different, but you could see like there's a lot of work that that I put into actual editing after I get the shot. So, you know. Carrie, what would you call when you when you refer to a fast lens? Jeff Voice wants to know what do you consider fast? F2 so like something or like F two, F one point eight, F two point eight, F one point four, one point two, those kind of things. So basically, F two point eight and and faster, I consider like a fast lens. Uh, a lot of like you can find some really good um, lenses at F one point four, um, like eighty five millimeter F one point four. That would that's a lens I want actually. That might cost um, something. Yeah, <laughs> Sigma. <laughs> And uh, I have a Canon 100 millimeter f 2.8, my macro lens, and I use that a lot. I love it. And that's actually a pretty old lens, too. Could probably get it for a couple hundred dollars, I think. So, yeah. Anything else? Where's your next trip to, Carrie? Oh, goodness. I don't even know. Well, assume we can travel somewhere. You're a Canadian. I you, to, you I can still to get to places. We can't. We're, you know. 
Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to go to Chile for the eclipse in December. Actually, we had a, a workshop planned there, but um, you know, based on the world situation, that has to had to be canceled. So, but you know, if something happens and travel opens, I might still go. So. And other than that, I mean, I really don't have anything planned. I really want to go to Iceland. I've never been there. I, I would just like, I have this fascination with the northern, um, with northern um, countries right now. Like, I'd love to go see the aurora up in places like Norway, <clears throat> Finland. Is Canada not north yeah. enough for you? Nor huh? Is Canada not north enough for you? <laughs> I'm actually south of like the U.S., like the general U.S. border, you know, the 49th parallel. So, you know, I feel like I'm pretty far south in Canada. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'd love to go up north, uh, like Yellowknife, Whitehorse, those places as well. Someday. Awesome. Isn't it uh, north? Isn't northern Canada be uh, better for the uh, the northern lights than like Europe? I don't think so. I think it depends on where the aurora is. Um, like the oval of the aurora is at the time. So, um, but, I think know, like the, the magnetic north be... of the Earth is over Canada. So I think I thought that it would be. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, you get a lot of good aurora here, but the thing is, is um. I don't know if there's as many locations that you can shoot it from um, compared to like in Europe where there's a lot more larger cities in that um, have that where you can easily see the Aurora. Um, but yeah, like Edmonton in, well, in, in Alberta is really good spot for Aurora. I think when you're hunting for uh, when you're hunting for Aurora, you want to get away from the cities anyway. And it's not really yeah. hard to do once you get up uh, near the Arctic Circle. Yeah, there are there are there simply aren't. I mean, you want to go to Narvik and Reykjavik and and uh, Juno. Yeah, Juno. not Juno is even out of it. It's too far south. Yeah, um, but but you just have Fairbanks. to be mindful of like the type of landscape, how rugged it is, and how dangerous it could potentially yeah. be. Like, you know, you're very isolated in some in a lot of places up in the northern northern Canada, but I know there's like a bit more population, and it's easier to probably travel in the northern parts of Europe over, let's say, the northern parts of Canada. So, but they definitely have like some Aurora tours up in like Whitehorse, Yellowknife, like those kind of areas. So you just have to also battle, like consider weather in those particular countries as well. So, you know, in the winter, um, in the dark months, you might have like some areas where it might, they might have a lot more cloud cover, uh, that kind of thing. So, yeah. But, Mm -hmm. I can tell you, Carrie, that I, I um, was part of a group tour to go see the Aurora uh, 10 years ago or something like that. And we had a good mm -hmm. tour, but we stayed at a hotel in Fairbanks. If I had a, had a rental car, I could have driven up to the ski slopes the first couple of nights and done everything that we were doing. There was a, this uh, ski resort near mm -hmm. Fairbanks within an hour where yeah. we could see the Aurora. And then... Uh, Ch what is it, Chennai and Hot Springs or something like that. Um, I could have had a reservation there, gone up there and done everything I did on the group tour. But I wouldn't have known that unless I had gone on the group tour to, to see it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I would think they can be, can be worried about our bears. <laughs> well, you have, you have some more presentation for us tonight, don't you, Carrie? Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> Actually, this is the part I dread. <laughs> Oh, that's oh, why you're okay. stalling. You guys Would you, hey, come on, man. It, it worked hey. in. It looked like it was. It was gonna work here in practice. So <laughs> let's give it a go. Okay, <laughs> let's let's see how we do this. Oh, I have okay. to hit escape out of here. Okay, so let's go to my phone. <laughs> Is that distracting? Having the presentation in the background. Is this okay? That's fine. We, we can see it. It is small type. This is where the uh, yeah, magnifier that we talked about would come in. I don't think I can do anything about that. Okay. Yeah, I think magnifier would be a little bit. What happens if I. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how to do it, but I think even if I could do it, I think it might just be cumbersome. I'm guessing. All right. Why don't you go and get started? And I'm going to look up how to do that. Get on it. Okay. Get that, on sounds it. Good. that sounds good. Okay. <laughs> 
So basically, first thing, um, I'm going to give this a, give you an example. Oh, actually, let me just go back to here. Um, um, so this is kind of what I want to give an example of. Um, uh, I kind of did this pre-planning already just to make this less painful. <laughs> So I picked a target of M31 and the flower pots from Flower Pot Island, and I might refer to this um, back and forth. So here's the view of my screen, and this is my planning screen on my phone. So you can see I have photo pills, and um, I've got um, all the different apps that I like to use. Typically, I've got calculator here because I use that too. Uh, Planet Pro is kind of a new app that I just discovered while I was working with PhotoPills when I was planning this presentation. And um, and Sky Safari, like I use Sky Safari all the time. So I even connect up my telescope, um, my mounts to it and for nights for uh, deep sky imaging on the road. I use Sky Safari to help me with that. So um, for this exercise, like I will go in Planet Pro, even though I do use PhotoPills, a uh, fair amount. Um, I found that Planet Pro just has some features in there that um, that I think people will find fairly helpful. So uh, let's just begin in Sky Safari though. So first of all, uh, what we want to do is find a target uh, that we want to take a picture of. So in this case, like you want to find something that's fairly bright. Um, obviously, the the smaller the focal, the smaller the the target, the more difficult your planning is going to be. It can actually become excruciating. Um, it's always better to start with large targets. And notice I'm avoiding the Milky Way. Um, okay, well, you know, and basically now, anyways, um, Milky Way is kind of. Oh, there it is. Yeah, we're avoiding the Milky Way because everyone takes pictures of the Milky Way. We want to find something different. So we're going to look at, let's sit, let's choose M31. So what I will do is um, M31 right now is probably not in a good position for astro landscape shots. Uh, let's just do a little search. So in Sky Safari, I'm doing that search. So we have M31 here. Uh, it says it, it rises at 4 o'clock, transits at 2 in the morning, sets at 11. Um, so that right now is is not going to work for us. Uh, but let's find out when it rises, um, what azimuth it is when it rises, because that's going to be key for helping us figure out where we're going to shoot this this object from, like where we're going to shoot. So when you click on the time symbol, it shows you. So uh, it basically rises. It's um, at an azimuth of, um, you know, around what is it 23 degrees? It's around 23 degrees when it rises. So the reason why we want to go rises is because it's going to kind of give us a general direction that we're going to need to look for, look, um, look in for when we're trying to choose our foreground target. Um, obviously, we're not going to be taking a picture of it when it's down at the horizon. So we want to find it when it's a little bit higher up. So let's say around like five degrees or so. Um, so we're going to just center M31 so we can get the get the details. So you could see up here, uh, it says like uh, northeast 33 degrees. It's at four degrees in altitude. So let's just work with it at four degrees altitude um, at uh, 33 degrees. Now we want to find a time of year to to work with it because here we, it's at five o'clock when it when it's that high. At, on September 20th, but we know that this is typically a, an object that rises um, more at a more reasonable time in, in the spring or early summer. So let's just fast forward now to, um, you know, some other time in the year. So just scanning across and let's say, okay, you know, maybe let's see where it is in June. So, oh yeah, this time period, definitely not 17, not at five o'clock. We want a little bit later in the, the night. So, oh, there it is. So, so in June, let's say June 17th, um, it's around, it's around, you know, three or four degrees at, at this uh, azimuth. 
So the other thing that you want to do is make sure that when you're the shooting time that you're going to shoot in, you it won't be during a full moon. And so for that, you can actually go to apps like PhotoPills or even Planet Pro to find, um, you know, where when the moon what the moon calendar looks like. So there's a moon calendar option, and you can go through here and scan across to find, I mean, there's so many, so many options and ways of, of getting, of finding out, um, you know, what type of moon phase um, is ideal for your target with um, photo pills and planet pro, but this is just a quick, easy way for me. Uh, so you can see like the new moon period is probably around um, the ninth, let's say eighth or ninth. So let's, let's then go to sky safari and we're just going to pick the ninth or, you know, that time. So around the ninth, and we want a time when it's a little bit higher up in the sky. So we're going to shoot around, um, you know, maybe like around midnight, let's say. So let's just, let's just go with this, 31, 32 degrees. So now what we're going to do is we're going to scan around in, in one of these planning apps, so PhotoPills or Planet Pro, and just kind of put in, they have like so many features in these apps, by the way. So um, here you can see like there's a blue arc going across showing you the, the, the position of the moon at certain times, and then the sun at certain times, and then we also have like the Milky Way. Um, at different times of the year and different times of the day, that kind of thing, or at night. So we're going to scan across to June, um, to June 9th. So to do that, we hit on the calendar view, and we can go to June 9th and click on it. And then um, from here, now uh, we have the azimuth of, um, of 31 degrees. So this they have this nice little field of view option here that you can kind of swing around and you can see the azimuth number right here. So we want to swing this around to like 31 degrees or so or in the 30s. And um, the thing now we have to consider is the focal length of the object. So we know that um, M31 is around three degrees, three degrees wide. Uh, so basically we want to, if we want to get a good shot of uh, M31 with the landscape feature, we don't want to be using um, a 14 millimeter lens or something like that. We want to use a lens with a substantial amount of zoom. So at three degrees, um, you know, you could probably even just use like a 200 millimeter lens, let's say and be able to get enough foreground features along with M31 looking at a reasonable size. So um, we can actually check that in PhotoPills too because they have a nice little feature here for field of view. So we could plug in like, okay, so yeah, 200 millimeters. And um, it tells us basically um, the degrees of, based on the sensor, because I put in here Canon EOS 6D and it tells me the sensor, it shows me the sensor size, like how many degrees across and up and down it is. So you know that Andromeda Galaxy will definitely fit in this field of view and give you a little bit of wiggle room to be able to frame your landscape. So now going back to Planet Pro, so I'm kind of jumping around in apps. I know it's a little confusing, but the unfortunate thing is that I haven't found an app that's actually um, geared towards this type of uh, planning. Like usually these apps are so, uh, they're centered around um, planning for astro landscape shots, shots for like moon, moonrise, moonsets, or sunrise, sunsets, and Milky Way galactic center shots. So um, in this case, we just we we have a, a very specific target that we want to work with. So um, the so what I'm going to do here in in Planet Pro is I will um, change the focal length to let's say 200 millimeters. And so now you see I have this field of view thing. So I really like this feature because then you can see like the size of, of that view. So obviously when you're close, when you're close to an object, um, you know, um, 
the, the uh, that object will fit in the field of view very well. But the further away you go, the the wider this this view gets. Like you can just see on the map here, um, it will get really wide. It gets wider. So anyway, so what I want to do now is I want to kind of line up, find a target, find a, a landscape feature that um, I want to image with M31. So if it's the other way around where you have a landscape target that you want to take a picture of, you kind of do it the other way where you find a spot where you want to take the shot from, you see the azimuth that you want to take it from, and then you can go into um, into an app like like Sky Safari and scan through Sky Safari for that time period to see what object will line up with that target, um, with that with that landscape feature. So in this case, we kind of have to find a landscape feature that will line up with M31. So um, and then one thing I know I knew is that there is this um, island called Flower Pot Island um, off of the Bruce Peninsula that have these really interesting looking. Uh, flower pots. Actually, you can see off to the side here. And uh, I thought, okay, that would be kind of cool to see if I could get M31 to rise above one of the flower pots. So um, I know where the flower pot island is. Oh yeah, the other thing to take note of is, of course, the light pollution. So in Planet Pro, it has an option here to have the uh, light pollution overlaid on here. So obviously, I don't want to take, take any pictures of M31 uh, near the horizon in any of these locations here where the where you have like the big cities with the white and the yellows and the oranges, you want to find something in a dark location. So this spot in um, Bruce Peninsula or this island here, Flower Pot Islands, will work out just fine. So let's just find uh, Flower Pot. So uh, actually you can go into Google into Maps at this point and just... Um, you know, kind of like scan around and see where these flower pots are. I actually use Google Earth, um, Google like Street View as well to see if there's any pathways or any um, like see how you can access these um, these features. And I did search around on Google Earth, and there were like some um, there were some trails going along here. So, and if you zoom in, you could see here are some of the flower pots. So here's one here, right there. And there's, um, oops, and there's another one here and another one over here in the center. So the thing though, is that if I want M31, it has to be around like in the thirties of azimuth. So I want to find a spot that I can shoot a flower pot from there. But also I have to take into, into consideration the size of this object and how far I want to be from it. So for instance, um, this flower pot, I'm guessing from photos that I, that I see that they're about 40 feet high, maybe a little bit more. And um, in order to get a re be able to use my 200 millimeter lens that I want to shoot M31, um, you know, basically I'd have to like kind of be at a distance of, um, if I'm at a distance of like 474 feet or 450 feet or so, then this angular size of this flower pot will be five degrees. So you just have, it's just a simple formula here to find out the angular size of it based on the distance. So here, 40 feet, I plugged in 40 feet for the size times 57.9, this is, um, number of degrees in a radian and uh, divided by the distance. And basically then I get five degrees or you can rearrange this formula in a way to say like, how far do I need to be away from the flower pot in order to get it to be a reasonable size so that it looks good with M31. So you see, it's like not really straightforward and um, I haven't found an app that will just figure all this stuff for you. So it gets a little more complicated and um, but if you can fig if you have these kind of formulas at your fingertips and you know exactly what you want to get, then it's totally doable. So basically, um, we want to be a few hundred feet away from away away from this uh, flower pot to be able to um, get a good shot of it with M31. So um, one thing we can do here is um, there's actually a distance feature here. 
on here that we can activate. Oh, actually, let's just put this back. So there's a distance feature on here, but let's just um, let's just say like we want to be at this location here. Like if we're here, if we're shooting from where the center of this is, then um, it might be like a few hundred feet. But then we want to go a little bit further further out, and we're kind of getting into complicated territory here because we're right off the coast. Um, but it could work, especially if the water levels are low in these areas, which oftentimes it does happen. Um, so let's just say, so now we have in, in this particular app, you have to set your camera location and your scene location. So we wanna shoot this flower pot right here. So this one right there. So we wanna add a camera view to that. So we can center it center this feature on there and we're going to click plus and add a camera location. So set the camera location or sorry, that's the scene location. We want to set the scene location. So that's what we're going to be shooting that flower pot. Now we can kind of move along to see um, where we should be shooting from. And I believe there's like a distance thing in here now. Hold on. Uh, where is this? Oh, is here. It in that? Yeah. Distance in view, right there, distance in view. So now basically it gives us our distance. So we can now play with the location based on the distance. And, um, you know, let's just say we want to be around right here. So that gives us about 500, maybe like five, oops. Whenever I hold it down too long, it, it does that. So that's about, oh, okay, look at that, 474. Imagine that. <laughs> so here we're going to add our camera location to the spot. So we hit the plus and camera location. So now we basically have like um, we have this uh, this line of sight now to our target. We can update tap to update the elevation, and it tells us that from our camera location to the target location of the flower pot is um, we're going to gain like. 0.7 degrees in like in in altitude or it's like 5.54 feet so it's basically nothing much to really worry about so um the thing now is when we put in when we know the distance and we know the height of the flower pot then we can calculate how many degrees it is the angular um, height above the horizon so we could say it's around five degrees so the thing is for m31 now we want to to be in a spot where M31 is higher than five degrees so that it can clear the flower pot. We want to line it up so M31 is right up over top of the flower pot. So we might want something like we want M31 to be at six degrees or seven degrees. So what we'll do now is go into the app uh, Sky Safari and kind of find out where it will be at um, six degrees or so, or at least five degrees azimuth. So I'm just kind of going minute by minute here. And so we have here about, okay, so let's just say six degrees. So that's getting close to uh, 35 degrees in azimuth. So basically at, at 10 minutes after midnight, it will be clearing the flower pot. And we'll go back to this app and then we might have to, then we're going to have to put the azimuth back on here. So we're going to check off the option for um, focal length. And we want 200 millimeters. We want azimuth of, what was it again? It was around 35. Yeah, 35. So yeah. So basically, in this location at 35 degrees, then, then the flower pot M31 should clear the flower pot at a degree above the flower pot, but we might want some more wiggle room. So then basically we could fine tune it further and kind of move our camera location around so that we have a little bit more so we can capture maybe M31 even higher above it. So the other thing too is, um, is uh, this isn't actually like the ultimate spot because um, there could be some land in the way. So it also has this really cool feature where it shows you 
along um, if there will be any obstructions. So it says there will be, but I also tried moving, moving this, um, moving it around into the water and it said that there were still going to be some obstructions of you. So I think like some of these apps, you kind of have to um, take some of the numbers with a grain of salt because it might not be 100% accurate for elevation. And um, the bottom line is you really should just kind of go there to see it for yourself, um, to see where what the shooting location is. And also there's you know chance that some trees, new trees or new shrubs could have um, grown in the field of view and or even some trees might have died. So um, so then that would open up your field of view even more. But generally, so that's kind of like the basic idea of what I would do for, um, for planning that particular shot. It's kind of, I mean, it's a bit cumbersome, of course, you, you're kind of flipping around between apps and doing some calculations, but that's kind of like the basic idea. Of course, like if you choose like a larger target, a larger field of view, then everything gets so much easier. But of course me, I have to pick like a hard example here, M31. But, um, but generally that, I mean, that's basically it for um, that particular planning. But, um, you know, depending on where you are, there might be so many options for, for you for foreground features and astro targets. And it would be ideal if there wasn't any water around here, because then we could definitely move or even the trees that because then we could move around and we would have so much flexibility. And in that case, we might not even have to even use this type of app um, to this level of detail. We could just kind of go on site and just move the, our camera around wherever we want to see where we can get a good um, a good position for those two target for those two um, two targets like M thirty one in the flower pot. So um, I mean I hope I didn't miss anything here, but um, I think that's generally the idea. Uh, Photo pills of course is pretty awesome app as well. Like it does pretty much the same thing, but I just found it didn't have the light pollution map that I wanted um, and some other features in there as well. Oh, the other thing with Planet Pro that that's really cool is um, it has like clouds. It tells you like, um, you know, based on the cloud heights, um, if certain features will be blocking, um, will be uh, blocked by the clouds. Uh, but of course, like this app, of course, like all the other apps, they're centered around the Milky Way core, the moon and the sun. So it won't help you when it comes to astro landscape, like other types of astronomy features. Um, if you want to use those in the photographs. So you have to you have to basically know um, what you're shooting and know your weather and and kind of do your own sort of planning outside of these apps to get it to work out. So I don't know if this is if um, you know this was helpful or not. Carrie, uh, is this a shot that you have done or you're planning to do? This is one that actually I'm planning on doing. So give me some uh, when do you plan on doing it? I think it was in June. Probably June. <laughs> oh, so we shouldn't hold our breath for that one. <laughs> It'd have to be June 9th, and there would have to be no clouds in the sky. But Carrie, you know, Carrie, what what was the? Um, you have three pieces of software you rely on: Photo Pills, Safari, Sky Safari, and then yeah, the third so one, which is what you actually showed us most of. Yeah, Planet uh, Pro. Planet Pro. Could you move uh, your? Can, can you move your, oh, sorry, your sorry. telephone sorry. screen a little bit so we can? I think it's under there. Is it Plant Planet Pro? Yeah, Planet Pro, right there. And and how's that Planet? That's not Planet. It's Planet. No, Planet. Okay, here. Oh yeah, here's the word, right there. That's planet. what I was asking you. Oh. Planet. Yeah. And is this a Mac and a Windows program both? I think it's on Mac as well. Yeah, it's on, sorry, it's on Apple and it's Android. On, it's on your phone, isn't it? Yeah, it's on my phone. I have. I don't know if, if they have like actual software. Yeah, Eric, Eric still uses his computer. He doesn't know about these phone things. Oh, shush. <laughs> I, I'm just looking, maybe it's an Android app too. Let me look it up. So yeah, her phone is, a, is an Android. I'm using, I'm using an Android, so yeah. it's on Android. And I do believe it's on Apple as well. Um, yeah, it is on Apple because some of the people I talk to that, that have used it, they use Apple. So yeah, and these apps are generally the same price, similar price around, I think it's $10 US for both 
photo pills yeah. and if you want planet pro yeah. photo uh, pills is I, nine 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 ninety nine and they won't accept my credit card because it's out of date <laughs> and and sky safari is that the the, the paid version or is it yeah all the paid version but i mean i think you can use like any type of um app i like sky oh. safari like i love i'm so used to using that app and that's my go-to um, a... version but you have to pay for this one and i don't i mean i don't to me i find it's it's worth the money because i use it to control my mount as well when i'm in the field it just does so many things for me um there's a free version of, of sky safari called sky portal that uh, has the same interface it just has a lot smaller catalog it's mostly for visual observing and it doesn't have like the mount control and stuff but i used okay. sky portal for quite a while um before i started uh getting into the dimmer deep sky target uh so yeah. yeah sky portal is the name of the free version yeah by the way carrie there's been lots of very nice comments about your presentation Oh, okay. Uh, I think I think you've inspired inspired a few people to give this a try, which yeah. hopefully is a good idea. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it's going to take a lot of pain in like planning, but I mean, if you're a deep sky astrophotographer, you know all about pain, right? So we've already in, we've already endured that pain, and it's yeah, it's so I mean, yeah. a little bit more pain. And you know, I just <laughs> feel like everyone just everyone's so focused on the Milky Way Galactic Center all the time. Like when you go on Instagram, that's all you see. And and I really want people to just be able to see that there's so many objects in the skies, like even um, even just asterisms, like framing like a, a really cool asterism with a foreground element. You don't need to have the Milky Way in every single shot. So, you know, that's the thing. And I feel, feel like this is something that astronomers and ask deep sky astrophotographers would love and would want to try out. And it just gives us an appreciation for the night sky for everyone, you know? So there's a lot more out there. So how dark do the skies have to be? I mean, it, it might be a dumb question, but we know what it is for DSOs. Uh, but um, we, we go out to local skies and you can see dim Milky Way. I mean. How dark do they have to be to do some of the work that you described? Um, like for me, like, okay, if you're looking at a light pollution map, I can basically take a Milky Way shot in the yellow zone. In the yellow zone is probably as bright as you want to get. You don't want any brighter than yellow, but green and blue and the black, of course, are, are where you would want to, um, to, to be for taking Milky Way shots or like any type of like night sky shots. Of course, if you're taking a picture of a constellation or asterism, then you don't really need to have those dark skies. You can you can be in um, suburban skies to, to take an asterism with a foreground feature. But when you start to get into deep sky objects or really faint objects, M31, if you wanna see the extended dust lanes, then you, know, you do need to have darker skies for that. And um, you wanna be in those, those the light pollution map zones where it's like, you know, the the blues and the greens. I forgot the numbers of the Porto class. What is it? Um, but anyway, so oops, wrong one. So Planet Pro, here you go. So they have like um, the light pollution maps here. The, it's like overlaid. So you can see um, generally like in the big cities, you have like the white zone here and um, that's basically the Boro class eight. So you might not be able to take that many. You can take big constellation shots in the big city. I've done that and it works out really well. Um, you know, when you get to the red zone, it's, I think it's a little bit, um, this picture here that's, that's here is a little optimistic in my opinion. So this is class five. And um, when you start to get into the, the greens and the blues, then you're getting into, you know, um, like darker zones where you can start imaging objects that are a little more faint. But with deep sky, like I find like from my home where I'm kind of in the orange zone, um, I can really do um, get really faint objects because we're doing, it's a different kind of, kind of imaging, like where we have a smaller field of view and uh, where it have like super long integration times compared to nightscape imaging where you don't really have that luxury um, of doing like really long integrated um, images. You just have like a shorter period of time. So you need to have like more bang for your buck in terms of like 
um, sky darkness. So um, I don't know if that helps. Awesome. Any other questions? I do have like a tiny little bit more left in the presentation. Okay, go for it. Yeah, so um, basically, so here was that. Okay, so I just wanted to just show you some calculations here for uh, like clouds. So um, this is a picture that I took of uh, the Toronto skyline across the lake from, from home. So that's about 33 miles away. So from that, you could see like some start some um, clouds in the back. These are cumulus clouds that are actually really, really far away. So if I was taking a, an astral landscape shot, assuming this wasn't as light polluted, um, if the target was this low, then of course these, these clouds will get in the way and become a problem. So I had a friend uh, that came up, helped me out with this and came up with this calculation for, um, for calculating um, distant clouds, like it, how far, how they will look in your field of view. And basically it comes down to after you do all these trigonometry um, uh, solving this equation, you will get the degrees um, above the horizon for where the cloud will be. So basically here's a cloud, it's far away, you know the height of the cloud, you know the distance that the cloud is, you want to know how far, how, how tall will it look in your night sky in degrees. So, um, and here's this little finger chart that I um, grabbed from the internet, um, just to give you a feeling for like what one degree is when you stretch your arms out, you know, one degree is basically your, fin your, your finger, um, your pinky finger, and 10 degrees is like your whole fist stretch out. So you can get a feel for um, heights that way. Um, so anyways, for this shot I here, think those numbers are double. What do you mean? The finger numbers are double. Finger is a half a degree at arm's length. Well, I think it depends on your size of your finger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, your, 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 thumb, your thumb is the width of the moon, and the moon is half a degree. Yeah, so I guess if it might be it, it might be different in metric systems. Oh yeah, maybe maybe that picture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, so here's this uh, the Canon my my picture here. I use a 400 millimeter lens, and I know from this combo here, it's five degrees field of view going across and three and three and a half degrees going up and down. And the Toronto skyline is 53 kilometers away, which is 33 miles away. And um, so basically I wanted to find out like how far away those clouds were. And it was a bit of a pain because I couldn't find any archive satellite images to show you guys as an example, uh, cause it's so far back in time. But I was able to find an archived radar image. So from that radar, I was able to figure that the clouds were approximately 150 kilometers away. Um, and because these types of clouds are towering cumulus, they could have been like around like five kilometers high um, in altitude. So then now plugging, typing that uh, little program into having it into a Python code and then just to make it easy for calculating so you don't have to keep using your calculator all the time is to just make a little code, um, plugging in those numbers. So we have a height of five kilometers. So you have to keep in the same, um, obviously keep in the same um, unit. So if you're gonna use feet, then keep it all in feet um, or miles, that kind of thing. So basically the height of the cloud is five kilometers. The distance is 150, um, 150 kilometers away. So, and you know the radius of the earth and plugging all that stuff, the height above the ground, we'll, we'll just say that we're like, as an observer, we're zero degrees, I mean, sorry, zero feet, zero meters above the ground. Um, then when you plug it through and run it, uh, you get like alpha, which is basically your altitude in degrees, you get about 1.2 degrees. So, and then looking at the photo here, like if this is three degrees going up and down, then 1.2 or one degree is, is roughly the, the height of these clouds. So that was just kind of just my way of trying to see if this um, formula actually worked. Uh, seems like it's reasonable. And uh, because I haven't really found any formulas online that, um, that would actually cover this. 
So, uh, so yeah, this is helpful to have something like this. So you can see if, if a weather system is going to affect you. And then this uh, here is a satellite image from a few days ago. This is a uh, tropical storm beta. And um, so now, like, let's say if you were like anywhere along this line, like, okay, so in this example, I wrote Delaware Bay. So that's right here. Um, in Delaware Bay, your forecast would be clear skies. And let's say you want to shoot the Milky Way Galactic Center that night. And basically, you're going to have um, you're going to have some problems because uh, the cloud is about 100 kilometers away from this location, from Delaware, the inlet of Delaware Bay. And um, we can kind of estimate, there are some, some um, satellites where they have a, a satellite derived height of the cloud. So you can get like the height of the cloud. And so we can kind of estimate like these clouds are probably 15 kilometers high. So plugging that into that formula, uh, we get about seven degrees angular like height for the cloud. So basically, seven degrees of your from your horizon up to seventy deg seven degrees will be cloud cover. So, and the closer you are, of course, like the higher that cloud will cover up your your sky towards the south. So, is there, and then, a, uh, is there a flat Earth version of these formulas? <laughs> I don't know why. I kind of felt to say that. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> We won't talk about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, basically, here's another another example here, where um, you know if I was I'm located here, so these clouds are just along Lake Erie. Uh, cloud distance is 30 kilometers away. Cloud height is about seven kilometers. Plugging it into the formula, you get 13 degrees. So. Um, so anyways, that's basically it um, for figuring out the cloud heights. But always, I mean, you don't have to use that kind of formula, but you just have to be mindful of, um, of these types of scenarios where, you know, weather system could be just like pretty close by, but your forecast isn't going to show it. So anyways, I think that's it. I really, I don't have an ending for this presentation now that I think about it. <laughs> Any um, other Eric, how are we doing on questions? Have we covered them all? Uh, I think we have, and a few okay. extra too. But great presentation, Kerry. I mean, just yeah, a lot we, of we're all help. kind of mesmerized here, thinking, "Where's our camera? Where? How can we take this picture?" <laughs> I know. I hope so. I, I just want you guys to be encouraged. I, I, to actually, out. I think where most of us are, if I'm speaking for me, is okay. I'm here camping. Yeah, there's some pretty stars. Uh, where can I find a tree to put in front of it? Yeah. I, I Actually, might, you know, might one way or the other. That's Honestly, and, and you know, the first picture we're going to take is going to be of the galactic center of the Milky Way. I mean, <laughs> we you got to start with that picture first, don't you, before you yeah. can be more creative. 100%. I agree. But once you take a couple of them, then, you know, try something else. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'm going to present my entire screen. Click, share, and let me see, let me see. Um, here's my screensaver. Beautiful. See, so I missed. Yeah, I, I did everything you said to do. I, you know, but yeah. OK, that was that's my screen share. Stop sharing. Is that Devil's Tower? <laughs> huh? Is that Devil's Tower? Yeah. The, um, that's where the spaceship came down to deposit. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Now, how do I get back to the meeting? Get back to the meeting. There we go. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, I found a, a really good weather website. I want to share with everybody. It's called um, Astrosphere. Astrospheric. Uh, Astros I love Astrospheric. Astrospheric. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> they have oh, the I, I can't that one. They have an Android app, by the way, if you guys didn't know. <laughs> the thing is uh, really cool. Like you could put smoke, uh, light pollution, jet, yeah. uh, the, jet stream, awesome. everything. The clear sky chart seems to have the light pol or uh, smoke pollution in it now. Oh, really? All right, cool. Tolga, are you going to share that? Or what are you doing? No, I'm, I wasn't going to share it. 
Yeah, you're just gonna tell. Okay. Yeah, I was. You can share. You can. Oh, somebody can open it, and I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm on my phone. Oh, okay. Um, there's, a, there's a there's Astrospheric uh, website, and then there's an Android app. I'm not sure if there's an iPhone app or not. Uh, and it also has a dark sky map in it as well, and a whole bunch of awesome weather data, satellite images, infrared satellite images. Uh, like it, it, it is the most comprehensive astronomy forecast app I have yet encountered. Okay. That's awesome. Um, Pam Morgan wants to um, replace Tolga as the encourager of, hey, get your likes in there, guys. Go click that like button for Carrie's sake. Uh, it'll help her um, when she applies for another job someplace. Um, she can put it on her resume that she got 88 likes from her YouTube presentation on the Astro Imaging channel. And I think we're getting ready to wrap up. Are we? Getting ready to wrap up here. We got everything in. Yeah, we're good. I okay. think we're good. Then, Carrie, I want to thank you, and I want to invite you back again. Don't don't be so long next time. You always bring <laughs> so much information to us, um, and uh, we'll see everybody next week. And uh, thank you, Molly. Thanks you're in charge. You're All in right, charge, I will I will take us out. Thanks again, everybody, for coming.